my Switch Up family and a massive thanks to all of you who have joined the channel recently. We really do appreciate it. I'm Mark Walker and today we're going to look at Ease 9 Monstrum Nox on the Nintendo Switch. And fair warning, the story segment is going to have some very early game spoilers. So you're talking about the first 10 or 20 minutes of gameplay. The Ease series started all the way back in 1987 with Ease 1 Ancient Ease Vanished and Ease 9 Monstrum Nox launched back in September of 2019. It's taken a while for it to arrive on Western shores on the Nintendo Switch, but it is finally here. We absolutely loved Ease 8 and thought everything about it from the setting to the characters as well as the musical score was just charming. It's definitely up there in my personal top 3 ARPGs of all time. How does Ease 9 Monstrum Nox hold up? And perhaps more importantly, what's the performance like on the Nintendo Switch? Well, eesh. let's find out. The story of Ease 9 follows once again Adel Kristin, adventurer extraordinaire, as he turns up to the city of Bald Duke, famous for its labyrinthian prison, which is host to numerous secrets and the basis of much of your adventuring. And you'll find yourself imprisoned very early on. For what exactly? Well, I'll let you find that out. And it's important to know that this is actually set after Ease 7 rather than after Ease 8. The Monstrum from the title are essentially beings of great power who have been summoned by a mysterious character and who have a very important role to play in the safeguarding of this universe. And it's not long before Adol is forced into the ranks of these anti-heroes who can be randomly called upon to fight off the creatures there. Why exactly you're doing this is explained over several chapters, 8 in total, as well as an epilogue of sorts. But what really makes any Ease game great are the characters and the interactions between them, and Ease 9 does that just as well as the others in the series. <laughs> Impressive. As far as gameplay and controls go, if you've played 8 then this will feel quite familiar with a few tweaks and changes. You control your character with the left stick, the camera with the right, and you can jump, double jump, and with the combat being directly controlled by the player in real time. As a monstrum, you unlock several new abilities, including various different attacks that have cooldowns that can be used by holding the R bumper and one of the buttons shown here. But what's really cool is that each new monstrum that joins your team grants you a new way of traversing the city such as being able to run up walls or glide slowly across vast distances. And as the game progresses, so does its verticality. You'll find lots of hidden chests dotted about, small blue glowing areas which give you a collectible, and points of interest. Now when you initially start the game, you only have a small area of the map accessible. You've got a fast travel system, but you'll find lots of barriers through which you cannot pass. This is tied to a curse in the story, but in practical terms, what it means as a player is that you'll have to undertake side quests and defeat any enemies that are linked to these rifts to raise this meter up here to over 100, which will then allow you to face off against, well, the big bad. These Nox fights are much tougher and take place in that alter universe. They take on a few different forms, the most common being a wave-based battle with progressively tougher enemies, with the aim of defending your main crystal. Now to dive a little deeper into the combat, each enemy has their strengths and weaknesses. The weakness is shown when you target them by pressing the X button, and you'll want to switch between characters to find the one that has the damage type to exploit that. And the combat here is outstanding. As you're dealing damage, you'll see a number of bars raising next to your player, known as SP. And this can then be consumed to use your attacks, but making a welcome return is boost mode. This mechanic was seen in Ease Origin, which we reviewed on the channel, and in any other game it would be called Berserk mode. Your damage increases massively, you can move quicker, take less damage, but it depletes very fast. If you press the L and R bumpers at the same time before it's dropped though, you can unleash a devastating finishing move. <laughs> If enemies are killed with your SP skills, it acts as a boost for the player, giving you back some of that lost SP. It's a very nice risk and reward mechanic that forces the player to actively go on the offense, but not in a mindless way, because there are two other mechanics, which are for me, the icing on an excellent combat cake. Combat cake. <laughs> I wonder what that tastes like. But with the left bumper, you can dodge in any direction. If you dodge just before an enemy strikes, it will gain you a small amount of invulnerability 
and time will slow down, enabling you to position and target a specific enemy. With the R bumper, if you block just in time as a strike's about to come in, this also affords you a bonus and negates the damage. And by the late game, for anyone on the outside looking in, combat looks like a chaotic mess, but for the player, it's a real dance of death, with everything feeling within your control. If you take damage, you can quickly pause, apply a potion or two or other item, and jump straight back into the action. And it's also worth noting that in Ease 9, at any point, you can press the plus button to save your progress when not in combat. Now, to help you along the way, you'll find lots of different shops and a plethora of gear and items to apply. You can also craft different things if you have the necessary components. And again, there are shops that facilitate this. The core systems are very streamlined. The movement, the combat, and even the game progression. Now, I mentioned the game barriers, which are essentially those walled areas. And while that mechanic initially made me a little skeptical about whether it was just trying to prolong it actually works really well in allowing the player a few options as to how to progress. The side content obviously unlocks you new gear and items, but the fact that you don't have to do it is also welcome. So we've got great combat, an engaging enough story, and good characters. But where does the game fall short? And the short answer is, it doesn't. But the long answer is, for many players it will in comparison to Ease 8. And what I mean by that is the location itself. Ease 8 Lacrimosa of Dana had a beautiful location. Every new area you visited seemed to have an otherness to it that made it feel like a real adventure. Monstrum Nox doesn't have that to the same degree. The city is drab and the prison no less so. Due to the different movement abilities, it is quite fun to traverse, but you won't find nearly as many moments where you'll stop and want to just smell the roses. The game features a number of excellent boss battles as you'd hope, and I do feel the refinements to the combat and other systems are most welcome. I liked building up the dandelion, your main base area, and recruiting new players to come and work for you. It's classic ease, it's very fun indeed, but for me, that location just lets it down a tiny bit. I give the gameplay 17 out of 20. My only issue with the controls were a couple of occasions where the lock-on mechanic just went a bit skew with and I ended up facing in the wrong direction. Overall though, they're very good, and they score 18 out of 20. As far as visuals and performance go on the Nintendo Switch version, there are issues here right off the bat. Now I have to say, like I actually have to say because it was in the embargo, that there are a number of patches coming. And specifically, there's a day one patch that's supposed to improve performance, but I don't have that and I'm reviewing what I've got right now. But I will update the top pinned comment, so make sure you look at the top comment to see if there's any change to this score. Performance has some real issues in both docked and handheld. While it targets 30 FPS, and some of the smaller areas achieve this with no problems, whenever you're outside in the city, you'll notice some severe drops. It can go as low as 15 or even 20 FPS, but it'll be hovering around 25 for most of your time, and it's noticeable especially when it's a game that requires lots of movements like jumping through the sky or gliding from one building to the other. Those stutters in gameplay and that lag mean that it just doesn't feel very good. It's such a shame and there's clearly some patchwork to be done as it can be 20, turn around 30, run down a corridor 25, turn around 30 again. I'm sincerely hoping that patch can improve things drastically. Another slight dig I have to say is the engine itself. It's starting to look very dated. Texture resolution's low, there's fog to reduce the draw distance, and while I like the character model designs, this engine is certainly beginning to creak. It becomes more noticeable as the game goes on. Well, see for yourself. It's not what the doctor ordered in an ARPG. As far as sound goes, everything's on point. There are some great tracks here, but also the E-Series ties the on-screen action to the soundtrack very well. It's something that I missed in Dragon Quest XI-S. It was so strange that some of the scenes had sad music playing or very happy music playing when it was supposed to be sad, and it's not the case here. Voice acting is also pretty okay. It's as hammy as you'd expect. You didn't come here for him, ain't that right, Crimson King? Then stay back. I don't plan on sharing my prey with anyone else. With the main character 
only uttering the occasional grunt, yes, or other single word. I think I would have preferred for them just to keep him quiet. Combat sounds are good, and it's just a shame the performance can't match it. In handheld, the same performance issues arise, and as far as text size goes, it's quite small, but it's not too small. There's no option to change it, but it definitely could have been a worse than it is. It's, it's playable in handheld. I give visuals and performance 8 out of 20, and the sound and audio scores 16 out of 20. Ease 9 is going to set you back £53.99 if you're going to buy it on the eShop or your regional equivalent, but you can buy the physical version for £40.85 here in the UK from Base.com. That's a massive drop in price. So essentially, buy the physical versions of NIS games, I think is the moral of the story. We saw the same with Disgaea 6. The base game will take you around about 30 hours to complete if you're someone that avoids side content, but that is not me. <laughs> That's probably why this review is a bit late. There's loads of other activities to dive into, and you could easily push that up to 50, maybe 60 hours. And then you've got the multiple difficulty modes, which will certainly afford some players a second run through. Regardless of a few performance issues, I've still thoroughly enjoyed my time and it's so nice to be back with these characters. Those issues will impact on the value score, but there's still a lot of value to be had here and a great action RPG. Value scores 16 out of 20. As it stands then, Ease 9 is a very good game that's let down by some performance issues. With a patch, this would easily be up in the 80s, but right now, it gets a switch up score of 75%. Let me know in the comments, is this one you're gonna be picking up? As you can tell from the gameplay and controls, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, but it would be remiss of me not to mention those big performance hits. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one, and let me know in the comments, well, if whatever really, say hello, nice one. For all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers guys. See ya!